Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar with Dr. Gwen Henderson. I'm Betsy Hatfield, Executive Director of Preservation Kentucky, and we're delighted that you were able to join us today and thank you for attending. We'll have time following the presentation for questions, but you may submit them throughout the webinar in the question section on your dashboard. For optimal viewing without interruption, be sure to close all programs, windows, and browsers. And if you're listening on your computer, be sure that your volume is turned up. We're very excited to have Dr. Henderson with us today to talk about archaeology and dispel the myth that Native people never lived permanently in Kentucky, when in fact they've been here since 9,500 BC. No one is more qualified to speak on this top topic than Dr. Henderson, who has conducted extensive archaeological field research in Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, Indiana, West Virginia, and Mexico, and has focused on the lifeways of prehistoric farming cultures in the Ohio Valley and indigenous groups of the region. Her educational credentials are impressive. She received a BA in anthropology from the University of Delaware, her home state, has a master's in anthropology from the University of Kentucky, and holds her PhD in anthropology with a minor in Native American history from the University of Kentucky. Dr. Henderson is currently staff archaeologist and education coordinator at the Kentucky Archaeological Survey and adjunct professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Kentucky. We'll send you a link at the end of the webinar to learn more about Gwen and her work and how to contact her. There are five handouts in your dashboard and Gwen will discuss these in her presentation. So now I'll turn it over to Gwen. Thanks, Betsy. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm thrilled to support the goals of Preservation Kentucky, an organization that works to educate and preserve Kentucky's heritage, both ancient and modern, by speaking to you today about Kentucky's rich Native American heritage. As I was preparing for today's webinar, I was struck by how very long I have been working to dispel this myth. Over 30 years, if you can believe it, I certainly can't. In the past, I've given presentations, I've written papers and prepared booklets, and now, this webinar on the topic, it's a logical next step, a 21st century step. I feel as strongly about this issue now as I did when I started, perhaps even more so, because over the years, I've gained an even greater appreciation of how this myth's persistence denies us our history. And make no mistake, although I titled this presentation, The Archaeology of Kentucky's Ancient Peoples, I am talking about history, people, and events in the past. The main documents, they are the villages and camps and cemeteries and mounds and earthworks scattered all across Kentucky that hold the objects and patterns of objects that reflect the lives of these diverse, intelligent, amazing native peoples. Their stories are the stuff of the first and longest chapter in Kentucky's history. I can't talk about everything during this webinar, I'm only going to highlight the main points and overwhelm you with images. I'm not going to do much explaining about how we know. That's for another time, perhaps another webinar. And I won't be talking about the many other myths regarding Native peoples, like the one that says all real Indians have died off, or that Columbus discovered America, or that Indians were savage and warlike, or that technologies we perceive today as simple were used by simple-minded people or that Europeans brought civilization to backwards Indians. Those are for another time, perhaps even another webinar. To my native viewers, this PowerPoint includes three drawings of burials and several images of ritual items. My reason for including these? I mean no disrespect, but people still ask me if ancient native peoples had government, religion, and economies. As a writer of children's magazine articles, I'm supposed to show, not tell. So, including these images is the best way I know of how to show, not just tell, people about these aspects of ancient Native life. My period of focus stops before the DeSoto Entrada of 1539. I figured that 10,000 years of history, more or less, was more than enough to cover in 40 minutes. It's going to be fun, but it's going to be a whirlwind. You can listen again on YouTube, and we have provided handouts with the details of Kentucky's native history on Preservation Kentucky's website. 
So fasten your seat belts, hang on, and let's begin. Let me review what the myth is about. The myth of the dark and bloody ground says that Indians never lived permanently anywhere in Kentucky. They only fought and hunted over it. <clears throat> the source of these myths is a statement made by a Cherokee chief called Dragon Canoe, who reportedly said that a dark cloud hung over the land known as the bloody ground during the signing of the Treaty of Sycamore Shoals in 1755. The myth owes its persistence to a number of factors, differences between Euro-American and Aboriginal ideas of land ownership. Native peoples did not think that you could own land just like you can't own the sun and the air. Europeans thought differently. The distinctions that the settlers perceived between historic Indian cultures and the remains le left by ancient Indian groups. What that means is the native peoples that the Europeans saw and interacted with historically were not people who built mounds. And when they saw mounds and saw that these native peoples weren't building mounds, they figured that other groups of people, other cultures of people had built the mounds but not those people. There was a benefit that land speculators received by encouraging people to think that this was a true fact, that native peoples never lived here permanently, because if they didn't, you didn't have to feel too uh, worried about uh, removing people from the land that they owned if they didn't own that land but, and, and only hunted here. The violent conflicts between Indians and bluegrass settlements during the 1770s and 1780s was also another reason why it was called a land of conflict, a place, uh, a dark and bloody ground because of the conflicts that were going on, truly conflicts that were going on in the 1770s, 70s, 80s. And the legend's early codification by widely read author and land speculator John Filson in his discovery settlement and present state of Kentucky, which you can see the cover of it here on this slide. John Filson calls it the dark and bloody ground. You can see in this green um, highlighted spot. Sometimes he called it the middle ground, but in truth, it's a lot more, um, uh, a more picturesque term to call it the dark and bloody ground then call it the middle ground. People read this book, 1784, believed it when he said that it was a dark and bloody ground, a conflicted place, that a place that no one claimed, certainly not indigenous peoples, and therefore the, um, the myth was begun. The Europeans first coming as the frontiersmen, then with their families, then on flatboats, and finally building their homes in Kentucky. This, this place without native peoples was the, uh, was the plan, was the idea for the settlement of this, of this land. The continuation of this myth into the, into the 20th century is continued in the Kentucky Encyclopedia. In an essay by Thomas Clark in the Encyclopedia, and you can see in the green highlighted area, none actually occupied with any permanence the present geographical pale of Kentucky, although Indians from North and South visited it. So even in 1992, when we would know better based on archaeological research that had been done for quite a number of decades. Still, this myth of indigenous people never living in Kentucky permanently um, has, has clouded our understanding of Kentucky's earliest historic eras. So, I'm telling you that this is a myth and it is not true. What I want to do now is prove to you, show you, 
convince you that this is a myth. This slide you will see at the beginning of each time period that I discuss. Ready? All right. First, we're gonna begin with the very first hunter-gatherers who came to Kentucky 14,000 BC and lived here until 10,000 BC. These people, the very earliest people, came from the West following the rivers and, and um, pursuing land animals, large land animals called megafauna in small groups, um, carrying their belongings with them in an environment that was much like Canada's today. You see this slide illustrating when the glaciers occurred in North America and how far down south they extended. The purple circle indicates northern Kentucky, and you can see that some of the during some of the uh, glacial ages, the ice was close to or covering parts of Kentucky. So you can only imagine with the ice being that close to Kentucky that the environment was much colder than it is today. It was wetter. The forests were made up of evergreens, fir and spruce. And um, the rest of the landscape, if it wasn't forested, was a park-like environment. A very different Kentucky than what we think of today. And here's several images of megafauna, the kinds of, of, of animals that the native peoples hunted with stone-tipped tools like this Clovis point that you see to the right. They also exploited smaller mammals and plants as well, but this particular um, stone tool, this Clovis point, was prepared for these larger animals. They used these spears uh, using their um, arms, the strength of their arms alone. And um, these, the sites where these people lived in Kentucky, because there were so few people and they moved so frequently and lived in Kentucky so long ago, the evidence for these kinds of places that date to this period in Kentucky are very few. One that uh, stands out, however, is um, Big Bone Lick up in uh, Boone County, Kentucky. All right. The people who were the descendants of the very first hunter-gatherers, which I'm referring to as the later hunter-gatherers, they lived in Kentucky for the longest period in Kentucky history. And that is from 10,000 BC to 3000 BC. It's a long time and many things happened at that, at, during this time. One of the things that is particularly important to remember during this period is that the environment of Kentucky became more what it is like today. Deciduous forests, um, in the barrens of Kentucky, there were prairies. People were hunting the kinds of animals that we think of when we think of animals today in the forests and so forth, bear and elk, deer. You can see in this particular um, image of native peoples from that time period, that they have brought in a deer that they have hunted. One guy is holding on to a snapping turtle. You can see the importance of plant foods in these folks' diet by the scattering of nuts on the ground in, in the foreground. Baskets are important. You can see that the folks are using nets to do hunting of, of fish. They've got a, um, there's a, a dugout canoe in the background. So the importance of fish and amphibians. And let's not forget the family dog. The dogs came across the Bering Land Bridge with the people from, from Asia as they came down into North America and across the plains and into Kentucky. Dog is, dogs are uh, uh, people's uh, earliest and, and best friend and used as a hunting animal as well. So in this uh, image, you can see the dog uh, messing around with somebody's uh, shoes, which is something that happens often 
in, in our houses today. All right, the native peoples, these later hunter-gatherers, no longer used just a spear with the strength of their arms as a weapon. These people developed a kind of tool called the spear thrower or atlatl, and that's spelled A-T-L, A-T-L. It's a Nahuatl term. What you can see at the top of this slide is how a person would use uh, an atlatl or spear thrower to throw their spear. The importance of this weapon is that it is more accurate when thrown, is more deadly because the force of the throw is stronger. And the other images are just showing elements of the spear thrower or atlatl and um, how the stone tools are, are, um, are attached to the spear. Here are some examples of the kinds of stone tools that are called spear points and I'm sure people will be surprised to realize that I'm not calling these arrowheads. And that's a re there's a reason why. Arrowheads don't begin to be used with the bow and arrow until 700 AD. What this means is that the atlatl or spear thrower is the longest used weapons system in Kentucky history. You can see the diversity of stone tool shapes and so forth for the spear points. And here's another example. All of these are spear points used with the spear thrower to hunt deer, bear, elk, turkey, and a variety of other small mammals uh, in the woods of Kentucky at this time. These folks are called hunter-gatherers, however, and the reason is they are gathering locally available nuts, berries for food, for dyes, for medicine and also for fiber. You can see the one picture in the lower right hand corner. Some of these um, plants, particularly plants like rattlesnake master, dogbane, and the inner bark of some trees produ produce fibers and these fibers can be prepared, twisted into yarn, and then fashioned into fabrics. Native peoples as Fisher, as fisher folk made their fish, fishing tools out of available bone and um, the nets from plant fibers. You can see here bone fish hooks on the right. But they also use the animal bone for ornaments. And on the left, you can see particularly distinctive Kentucky centric hairpins. Native peoples along the Green River lived in larger groups than in other places in Kentucky at this time. And their shell mounds, where they lived and threw out the freshwater mussels that they collected along the shoal areas in the Green River, um, are particularly distinctive of the shell mound culture in this part of Kentucky. Native peoples, these hunter-gatherer gardeners, were also people who had religious beliefs, a belief in the afterlife, and so buried their dead relatives with a variety of items. This picture, this drawing here of a burial, of a grave of a person who died um, in the Green River area, um, it has been buried with a bone pin, a biface, or a stone tool, um, a drilled shell pendant. This illustrates that these native peoples had a belief in the afterlife, placed their dead carefully in graves, and had rituals and ceremonies that made um, explained the unexplainable to them, just as our religions do today. These folks so long ago were also involved in the trade of rare objects and perhaps not such rare objects across long distances. In this image, you can see a copper ornament and other kinds of stone and bone that would not have necessarily been um, common 
in Kentucky. For example, finding a copper ornament in Kentucky means that someone had traded for this object made by people far away. The closest place for copper is in the Midwest up in Minnesota. So we know that this object was traded into Kentucky long ago. Around 3000 BC, native people's lifeways begin to change and they are referred to as the hunter gatherer gardeners. Their lifeways began around 3000 BC and extended to about AD 1000. These folks got their subsistence, got their food from animals and plants as before, but they also had turned to growing their own food. Experimenting with growing native plants had begun towards the end by the hunter um, gatherers, the later hunter gatherers. And it became an important, the growing of native plants became an important way of life uh, with the hunter gatherer gardeners. They were still uh, hunters with um, the atlatl, and here are examples of what their spear points looked like, with the kinds of animals that they hunted, the very same kind that their ancestors had hunted, and they collected the same kinds of nuts as their ancestors had collected. But what was different was they were depending on plants that they had grown for food, native plants that they had domesticated. What this means is that in Eastern Kentucky, where the information has been collected that's most clear, Eastern Kentucky is, like other places in the world, a world hearth of plant domestication. Um, those other places that you can see in the upper left-hand corner with the blue stars, those are other world hearths of plant domestication. And some of the plants that were domesticated in those spots, like wheat and barley in the Middle East or corn in Mexico, are very familiar to us. We're not quite as familiar with the plants that the native peoples domesticated and grew here in Kentucky, like goosefoot, like sunflower, like maygrass. But these plants were grown and domesticated and are a world hearth on the par of any other place in, in the world. These folks used fire to clear their garden plots and digging sticks to plant the seeds. We refer to it in Eastern Kentucky as the Eastern Agricultural Complex. And it's something that extended across uh, mo most of the Midwest and Southeastern United States. These plants were starchy seeded or oily seeded plants and also included squash, native squash. The starchy plants were goosefoot and maygrass, and the oily seeded plants were marsh elder and sunflower. The squash, the native plant, um, was looked more like a gourd does to us today. Goosefoot, or quinopodium, is a plant that is a relative of quinoa. And those of you who have eaten quinoa salads, just imagine that you're eating goosefoot instead. You can see here in this slide examples of charred um, goosefoot seeds, and it's these seeds that give us the information. Maygrass, another starchy plant, um, and you can see the seeds here as well as what the plant looked like. Erect knotweed, just recently, archaeologists discovered that the earliest evidence of domesticated erect knotweed anywhere was found in ritual contexts at a Garrett County, Kentucky site. 2,000 year old seed found at a Kentucky site illustrating native people's domestication of erect knotweed. Sunflower also has uh, a significance in that the, the, the seed you see here on this slide, it's the outer shell and seed of an ancient sunflower specimen found in a rock shelter in Menifee County. People who are interested in human domestication of native plants know all about this sunflower seed. Marsh elder and sumpweed are also an example of starchy 
I mean, of, of oily seeded plants. The domesticated plants are joined with ones that were cultivated, but not domesticated. And that includes giant ragweed, as well as little barley. Another important element likely linked to the beginning of growing their own food is new kinds of containers with which to prepare, process, cook, and store these new plant foods. The red circle shows the earliest styles of indigenous pottery that was made in Kentucky. And a third important development, cultural development in this, during this time period is that native peoples in Kentucky, in selected areas of Kentucky, built sacred circles and earthworks, which you see here illustrated um, the Mount Horeb earthwork on the left and the Old Fort earthworks enclosure in Greenwich County and burial mounds, in this case, illustrations of the Robbins Mound um, and the Wright Mound in Boone County and in Montgomery County, Kentucky. These burial mounds are referred to as accretional, which means they grew over time. If you take a look at the blue picture, you can see numbered regions of that cutaway view of the mound. It started as a very small mound, number one, grew, number two, number three, four, and so forth. These very large mounds started out, however, with a circular arrangement of paired posts. And you can see that example on the left. The native peoples who built these sacred circles and these burial mounds are referred to as Adena by archeologists. And here is an, an artist's illustration of what one of the burials looked like in the Wright Mound in Montgomery County. This is a log lined tomb in which two individuals were buried. The Adena people also buried their dead in non log lined tombs. They also cremated their, um, the dead and placed them in clay, in clay pits in, in these burial mounds. This is an artist's rendition of what one of the burial mound log tombs might have looked like um, with an individual laid out in it before it was closed up. The reason why this individual's feet are covered by fragments of um, cedar bark is that if we had drawn it with him completely covered with cedar bark, which he was, then you wouldn't see him in the picture covered up by the bark. So the example with his feet covered up indicates that the entire person was covered. But this way, you can see how a person is laid out on his back with wrapped in fabric and laying on a pallet. Some of the items that were buried with the Adena people include objects made from copper, like copper bracelets and this copper dagger, but also fabrics, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Sometimes stone tablets with illustrations of important ritual symbols are affiliated with these Adena mounds, and you can see two examples at the bottom. The item at the top is a wolf jaw palette, which has been shaped and formed to fit into a person's mouth, a shaman's mouth. This particular um, wolf jaw palette was found in a mound in Owen County. During this time of the hunter-gatherer gardeners, Native peoples also created petroglyphs like this pecked stone image of a turtle and pictographs. But they also explored, began exploring Kentucky's deep caves like the ones in central Kentucky and the ones in, in western Kentucky like Mammoth Cave. This particular illustration is of a glyph drawn in the mud. The actual glyph you can see in the upper right-hand corner 
yep, in the lower left-hand corner is an artist's drawing, uh, a scale drawing of what was drawn in the mud. Images of pregnant women signifying some kind of link to a concern with fertility. The native peoples in Kentucky also uh, went into the caves for more than just ritual reasons. There is good evidence in the caves in the Mammoth Cave area that native peoples explored in the caves and also mined selenite and mirabolite from the walls of the caves. Here you see an artist's reconstruction of what the cave mining might have looked like in some of the higher passages of Mammoth Cave. Now, during the hunter-gatherer gardening time, around 700 AD, native peoples lay aside their spear thrower and spears and take up the bow and arrow. At the top, you see examples of some of the earliest arrowheads in Kentucky. And you also see an illustration here of all the elements of a bow and arrow. A bow and arrow was particularly uh, effective weapon. It was, you, you could shoot an arrow further than you could shoot a spear with a spear thrower. You could be more accurate. And the way you hunted with a bow and arrow was different than the way you hunted with a spear thrower. Here in this red circle, are what the pottery jars look like towards the latter part of the hunter-gatherer gardener time period. And here is an illustration of a, one of the later hunter-gatherer gardener uh, villages. Circular arrangement of houses, circular houses covered with mats. You see a woman making pottery, a woman standing, making fabric. The native people's uh, creation of fabric did not hinge on having a, 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 a loom at all. This was finger weaving or twining. And a man and his son are examining his arrow. Now we turn to the final time in Kentucky's native history before Europeans. This is the time of the hunter-gatherer farmers that goes from A.D. 1000 to A.D. 1539. Two different native cultures existed in Kentucky at around A.D. 1000. In northern and eastern Kentucky is the Fort Ancient people, and in eastern and southern Kentucky, the Mississippian people. It doesn't mean that these are people from Mississippi. It means that the culture which began uh, its um, its most um, earliest expression in the Mississippi Valley is the reason why these, these people are called Mississippians. Okay, I'll begin with the Mississippian folks. The Mississippian hunter-gatherer farmers lived in large towns, in this case, one surrounded by a stockade. They lived also in large villages, small villages, farming, communities and little farmsteads. Their hierarchical organization of settlement focused on the largest towns. In those large towns, the chiefs lived on top of mounds and they also had significant mounds for ritual um, ceremonies. Here's an example of one of those flat topped earthen mounds at a Mississippian site in Kentucky. The native peoples who lived in Western and Southern Kentucky, these Mississippian cultures, their leaders were born into their roles. It was a hereditary way of government. Ceremonies were held on the tops of the mounds. The people, the commoners, stood in the plaza in front of the mound and watched the ceremonies go on. Ritual information was the bailiwick of the shamans and the chiefs. So there was a distinct difference 
a distinct social standing difference between the chiefs and the common people. Later in time, after 1400, the hunter-gatherer farmers of Western Kentucky no longer built the flat top mounds, but they still lived in large villages. Here's an example of a large village um, that was located at, uh, in Kentucky and Union County across from the mouth of the Wabash River. Still, they had plazas, they buried their dead in family cemeteries, and there was still a kind of uh, social stratification even then. Here are some examples of what um, these folks' houses looked like. They were made from wattle and daub. What this means is a rectangular arrangement of posts with interwoven wattle, which is sticks, covered, plastered over with mud that dried in the sun and then whitewashed and painted with symbols significant to themselves. You can see here their roofs were thatched. These farming peoples still use the digging stick, but they used hoes to uh, work their fields. And you can see these stone hoes examples and one that's hafted so you can see exactly what that stone hoe might have looked like. And what kind of plants did they grow? They grow squash and corn and kinopodium. Corn is not a native plant to Kentucky. The squash that they grew was still native, but the corn came up from Mexico through the Southwest and arrived in the Ohio Valley around 1000 AD. They grew kinopodium or goosefoot like their ancestors had done, their hunter-gatherer gardener ancestors and may grass as well. They also uh, continued to rely on nuts. They ate the wild bean, but they did not cultivate until really late in their history, the common bean. They stored their plant food remains, which would uh, go bad if not stored, in um, pottery, but also in something referred to as a bell-shaped pit. Here's an example of a bell-shaped pit. It looks like a bell. The native peoples dug these deep bell-shaped pits, covered them tightly with uh, grass and earth and skin and so forth. And the perishable plant remains were able to preserve throughout the winter and be useful um, come spring. The folks in Western and Southern Kentucky uh, focused on deer, raccoon, turkey, and terrestrial animals like, um, like turtles. They also were exploiters of fish in the backwater sloughs uh, of their homeland. This is what their arrowheads look like. And these folks, like their ancestors, were people who made pottery. It's just that their pottery styles and shapes were different. Here are examples of a very a unique kind of decoration that is found in Western Kentucky. It's called negative painting. And the examples on the top are sherds of negative painted designs um, that uh, these folks made. It's a kind of negative resist painting technique. The native peoples in Western Kentucky also made beautiful fabrics, the um, description of which we can get because the pans uh, very shallow vessels that they uh, made in shallow depressions in the ground bear the impressions of the fabrics that they lined those impressions in the ground. So you can see diversity of fabrics here impressed on the exteriors of these vessels. Here are examples of other kinds of hunter-gatherer farmer vessels. These are ones uh, from uh, Western Kentucky after 1400 AD. The importance of um, symbols and ritual 
that we um, noted during the uh, hunter-gatherer gardener time uh, continues on in hunter-gatherer farmer time. Some elements of ritual are similar. Here you can see a, sh a shell gorget and a stone gorget um, uh, illustrating uh, significant symbols uh, in their cosmology. The importance of catlinite pipes and the smoking of pipes ritually is illustrated by these um, pipes from uh, hunter-gatherer farmer uh, villages and towns in western Kentucky. Now I'm going to turn to the hunter-gatherer farmers of central and eastern Kentucky, whom archaeologists refer to as the Fort Ancient People. These people lived in villages. Here's an example of a circular village in central Kentucky, a central post, a central plaza, houses around the plaza, and the village guard, the village farms extending outward from the village. Examples of organization, of internal organization of these villages come from several different sites in Kentucky and Ohio and each one is organized in a slightly different way. You can see, for example, the, For the Florence site complex site in Harrison County has a mound in its plaza, people buried in, the, in a grave, in graves around the plaza, living then in back of the graves and throwing their trash out in back of their houses. But at the Sloan site, the organization of activities inside the village is different. People are buried on the outer ring of the village and they their village was circled, encircled by a palisade. Later, after around 1400 AD, the village farming people of central and eastern Kentucky no longer lived exclusively in circular villages. Some people who lived in larger villages no longer, they sort of outgrew the circular village. They lived in long houses and they lived in clusters of long houses in villages uh, scattered across ridges and floodplains. These people also in the winter time moved to smaller hunting camps. The people who moved to these camps were the able-bodied hunters, women and children, older uh, folks, uh, women with infants and so forth still lived in the village. What made these farmers different from the farmers in Western Kentucky is that village leaders were based on personal achievement, not on who was their relative or who was their father. It was a much more egalitarian society or differences were based on age and personal accomplishments rather than on birth. Here's an example of an individual buried in a stone box grave um, with kinds of um, arrowheads and bone, bone um, projectile point or arrowhead also as well. These people, the hunter-gatherer farmers of Eastern and Central Kentucky, these folks followed the Three Sisters agricultural system. What this means is they turned their back on the starchy and oily seeds and the nut gathering of their ancestors and threw themselves whole hog into growing corn, squash, and beans. The squash is the same native squash that they had always grown, but the corn, like the corn in Western Kentucky, is not native, it would have come like in Western Kentucky, uh, up from Mexico, through the Southwest and into the Ohio Valley. The beans came later around 1200 AD. The Three Sisters agricultural system is a very stable kind of agricultural system. It is self-sustaining. The corn, um, takes a lot of nitrogen from the soil, the beans replace it. The corn stalks are tall, the beans grow up the corn stalks 
and the squash grows along the ground to shade it from weeds. The Ford ancient farmers also used a digging stick, but for their hoes, they used deer shoulder blades or elk shoulder blades and also heavy freshwater mussel shells you can see here. Their squash, corn, and common bean, illustrated here. In this picture, you can see in the bottom right an example of a burned corn cob and an example of it before it was burned. This is called eight row corn because eight rows of corn kernels are what occurs on this kind of, of corn cob. Eight row corn is what the native peoples grew in Eastern and Central Kentucky. The common bean is a bean that we think of when we think of refried beans or beans and cornbread. The charred examples in the picture in the in, on the, to the left, the charred examples are the Native American beans. The non-charred examples are heirloom beans. The same kinds of heirloom beans that we grow today are the kinds of beans the native peoples grew 1400 AD, 1200 AD. The Ford ancient people also preserved their food in um, deep pits like you see in the upper left-hand corner and an illustration of it, the um, bell-shaped pit on the right. These folks also used the bow and arrow. Here's examples of their kinds of arrowheads. These folks um, focused their hunting on deer, bear, elk, and turkey. Here are some other examples of stone tools. These particular objects are ones that were used in hide processing. processing. In the upper left-hand corner, you see um, stone scrapers, and on the right-hand side, uh, chip limestone discs that were used for deer hide preparation. The Fort Ancient people carved stone smoking pipes from uh, siltstone and sandstone, and they also had discoidals, which we think may have been used as drop spindle corals uh, made from stone. They sometimes had uh, geometric or animal designs on these objects. The Ford ancient people also made jars, but the style of their jars and bowls uh, were, were different than the style of pottery that the Mississippian peoples made at the very same time. Ford ancient people used animal bone and animal teeth as ornaments. You can see a slide here of animal teeth on the bottom. And marine shell and freshwater shells were also important for use as ornaments. The small ornament, ornamental shells up at the very top in the center are called marginella shells. These are marine shells. So we know that the native peoples in Kentucky throughout the state were engaged in the um, exchange of non-local goods, in this case, marine shell. This is where the story of Kentucky's native peoples before the Europeans stops. This doesn't mean that this is the end of the Native American story. It's just, it just means that it's the end of our story right now. I hope that you can see that the native peoples lived in Kentucky permanently. They lived here for a very long time. And the myth of the dark and bloody ground is just that, a myth. And now, I'll turn it over to Betsy. Thank you, Gwen. We've had a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, what plants did the native Kentuckians smoke? You know, that's a really good question. I mean, we've got the pipes. We saw the pipes, so they, they, we know they're smoking something, but what exactly were they smoking? Um, based on our research, and it's difficult to find this kind of stuff unless it's been burned, and certainly after something's been burned in a pipe, it's turned to ash, and we can't figure out what it is. 
Our guess is from ethnographic and ethnohistoric documents that the native peoples may have smoked a kind of, of uh, combination of sumac and other plants, which uh, historically was referred to as kinikinik. Are there a top two or three sites in Kentucky that you recommend visiting for lay people to experience some of what you've discussed? Are there any undisturbed? That's a great question, and I wish I could tell you about all the sites that are on private property, but the landowners would shoot me. So what I'm going to do is share with you um, some uh, sites that come to mind that are on public property that you can go to without getting, without the risk of being run off um, for um, trespassing. Okay, there is Wycliffe Mound State Park out in Western Kentucky. It's a Mississippian Temple Mound site. There are hunter-gatherer gardener mounds in a park in downtown Ashland, Kentucky. It's a public park, so you can go and see them there. If you're interested in seeing a large accretional burial mound of the Adena people, I suggest that you drive to Mount Sterling. Get yourself a soda and look over your right shoulder and there you will see the Gateskill Mound. If you are interested in seeing another flat-topped um, Mississippian mound, you could go to Canton, Kentucky, and in downtown uh, Canton, and I would say downtown Canton is a misnomer because it's a very small town, though sweet, overlooking what used to be the, uh, the Cumberland River, you will see um, several large uh, Mississippian temple mounds there. If you ever have an occasion to go to Berea, Indian Fort Mountain is owned by Berea College, uh, or maybe it's owned by Berea, I'm not sure which. This is a place where um, each, uh, twice a year, uh, uh, an artist's fair is there, and there's a there's a trail that you can take out from away from where all the artists are selling their wares and you can see the Indian Fort Mountain mounds there. Um, I wish I could tell you that there were some village sites that you could go to see, but <clears throat> frankly, they kind of look like plowed fields. So that's not particularly visually appealing, though I will say uh, in, um, in Ohio, outside of Dayton, is a reconstructed Fort Ancient Circular Village called Sunwatch, and you can go there. The museum is very good. Um, if you're interested in going to um, a, a, a site with uh, Mississippian mounds outside of Kentucky that has quite a few mounds, um, I would recommend Angel Mounds outside of um, Evansville, Indiana, and, and uh, Henderson, Kentucky. Really a great place. And then we can't forget Mammoth Cave. You can go to Mammoth Cave and see the cave where the native peoples had walked and explored. If you're interested in seeing places where archaeological sites are from um, just an archaeological site in general, not a, necessarily a Native American site, um, I would recommend um, Riverside, the Farnsley Mormon Landing in Louisville, uh, Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate, in, Lew in Lexington, both of those sites have um, um, exhibits that are linked to the archaeological work that was done there. Um, and then Camp Nelson, they have reconstructed one of the uh, forts there and have um, done an enormous amount of archaeology uh, at Camp Nelson for a historic period. And then I would be remiss in not recommending everyone go to the Kentucky History Museum in Frankfurt there, when you enter, you will see discussion of Native American ways of life. The Indians lived in Kentucky permanently, people. The museum says so. How do you know how old these sites and cultures and objects are? We know how old these sites are based on two different ways, actually three different ways of figuring out their age, either their actual absolute chronological age or their relative age. The absolute 
chronological age, we find out generally by um, radiocarbon dating, charred plant remains or charred bone, all um, living things uh, take up carbon uh, while they're alive and when they die, it starts to decay. The radioactive carbon-14 decays at a regular, reliable, and measurable rate. And so using that information, you can get a, t a date, an absolute date, plus or minus um, so many years, five years, 10 years, 50 years, um, the actual date in radiocarbon years. Um, that gives us an understanding of of how many years ago in an absolute sense. In a more relative sense, there are ways to figure out how old something is by comparing similar objects found at two sites from different places, suggest that the two are uh, contemporary. And then sites in places where uh, people have lived for a long time, particularly on um, floodplain settings where uh, water, floodwaters deposit flood deposits, soil and sand and so forth, and create stratified sites. We know from um, just uh, the law of superposition, which is a geological law that says nothing more than things at the bottom are older than the things on the top. And so in a relative sense, we know that something's older than something else if it's deeper in a stratified site. So by comparing, by using absolute dating, and by using relative occurrence at a site, we can figure out how long ago someone lived there and, and how old the objects are that are at that site. Were bison a relative late comer to Kentucky and hence not referred to in your list of most common game species? Yeah, that's a good question and that's a good, that's a good notice. I purposefully left out bison because bison, during the time period that I was talking about, were not in Kentucky. Actually, that's kind of a lie. Um, there were big bison, Pleistocene bison, during the hunter-gatherer, the earliest hunter-gatherer living in Kentucky. And then they disappeared. They died out with all the other megafauna when the environment um, became more like today, and the um, ice sheets retreated north. It wasn't until the 1600s that the bison that we think of, uh, the buffalo, the bison, uh, came across the Mississippi River because of a change in, in environment. The, the, um, the prairies expanded, and with it, the bison came. And so Native peoples um, exploited the bison, certainly, when the bison were here, but uh, the bison didn't come until around the 1600s. So while on the one hand, the descriptions of Kentucky, early Kentucky, by the earliest settlers and explorers talk about all these bison they saw, in truth, the bison were pretty, were, were pretty latecomers to, to the picture. Was there intentional erasure of native sites by the United States government in order to encourage settlement or, or for other purposes? Well, let's, okay. We know that Andrew Jackson's removal policy in the early 1800s forced native peoples living east of the Mississippi west. Okay. But we're talking here, or your question here, is about intentional erasure of native sites in order to encourage settlement. So I'm assuming here that this question is about the 1700s. Well, um, the United States government uh, was far away in the 1700s, the federal government. Intentional erasure of native sites um, that the federal government said had to be done, like a law or a directive. That, to my knowledge, did not occur. However, um, the people who, who moved to Kentucky, thinking that Indians never lived here permanently, but only hunted here, could uh, 
with reckless abandon destroy uh, native sites when they built their houses and built their roads and started their farming and 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 their light and their and their industries so while there wasn't an intentional erasure by the native but of native sites by the US government there was erasure of native sites by virtue of the fact that uh, people from the colonies came into Kentucky to settle and therefore erased many sites. Is there an official informed trained Kentucky group studying sites in Kentucky for public education? Wow, what a great question. Um, well, I would say um, I can plug the Kentucky Archaeological Survey here <laughs> because um, that is one of the things that um, we do. The Kentucky Archaeological Survey is trained to study sites for public education. But I would say that archaeologists who work for the state and for the federal government, so that would be folks at the State Historic Preservation Office or people who work for the um, math cave or the various, um, you know, the, the Forest Service, um, those folks uh, are informed and trained uh, in, in public education. Can you explain or describe a conch shell gorget and how frequently in Kentucky were they found? Okay, a conch shell gorget. Okay, so conch shells are marine shells. They're big marine shells. Whelks oftentimes are what the, the gorgets are made out of. Okay, and what a gorget is, is something that is worn around the neck. It's a French term, gorge or neck. Okay, so a conch shell is cut in such a way that the slightly bent and smoothed part of the shell is uh, removed, is cut off and shaped from the, the shell itself and then uh, engraved with designs or not and drilled with holes to suspend from the neck. Um, they were found um, frequently, well, I don't know how frequently they're found. I mean, these are certainly not as common as arrowheads and spear points, um, nor are they as common as the animal food remains and plant remains that are found at archeological sites where they're preserved. However, I would say that um, these, these gorgets, the, uh, the conch shell gorgets are particularly um, diagnostic of um, the hunter-gatherer farming cultures of both Western and, and Eastern, Southern and Northern Kentucky. And they would have been gotten in trade. These are, um, these are marine shells. So they were gotten in trade for the exchange of other kinds of things that Native peoples had here in Kentucky. You never mentioned the names of Native groups I'm familiar with, such as Shawnee and Cherokee. How are these ancient groups related to the Na Native peoples today? Okay. Um, the ancient peoples that I was describing in this webinar are the direct descendants of Native peoples who live in the United States today. Having said that, how do I connect the native peoples, the hunting, gathering, farming peoples, um, Western Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky with indigenous peoples now? Part of the problem that we have in doing this is that in the late 1600s, smallpox arrived in the Ohio Valley and 90% of the people who lived in the Ohio Valley died because of that. This was a disease from Europe, which they had no natural immunity against. So the vibrant cultures of the, um, of the time before smallpox and, the, and, and the, the people who were left after smallpox um, are, are, are difficult to connect one to one because some groups disappeared completely. 
and there were groups that were um, historically that appear in in his in history in written history documents uh, paper documents that um, are amalgamations of perhaps many different groups and they take the name of Shawnee or Cherokee, Wyandotte, Piankasha, Miami, Creek, um, Chickasaw, and so forth. So for one, one of the reasons why I didn't mention any names is because I did not go into the time period uh, in, my, in my webinar. But number two, it's difficult to make a one-to-one -one correspondence because of the effects of, um, of, of disease that Native peoples experienced in the six, late 1600s. I've seen early maps of downtown Louisville showing mounds. Who built them and when did they disappear? Great question. Indians lived in Kentucky permanently. They lived in Louisville. Those mounds could have been built by the hunter-gatherer gardeners. They could have been built by the hunter-gatherer farmers. In fact, I'm pretty sure that they, for sure that they were built by hunter-gatherer farmers because of some of the descriptions of them being flat-topped and so forth. <clears throat> Who built them? Hunter-gatherer farmers, hunter-gatherer gardeners, and where did they go? Louisville came. What a very convenient thing to have. That big earthen mound that you could use for fill dirt or for construction purposes. Never mind that there were human remains in them or pottery or anything like that. Louisville was on the move. Louisville was on the growth. And so therefore, um, the, the mounds of, of downtown Louisville uh, are no more. Can you talk briefly about the Serpent Mount in Boyd County? That's a great question too. The serpent, there's a serpent mound in Boyd County in Eastern Kentucky. This serpent mound in Boyd County in Eastern Kentucky is made from stone. It's not like the serpent mound in Ohio, which is made from, from earth. This one's made from stone. And um, many years ago, archeologists investigated and mapped that uh, stone serpent. And uh, they, the map looks really great. It looks like an undulating serpent with a head and a tail. Um, but unfortunately, um, the excavation across selected areas of the tail, of the tail and the body of this of this serpent, revealed nothing except rock. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't objects placed in the mound that didn't deteriorate in time. That doesn't mean there wasn't anything at all. Or it's possible that the idea behind this serpent mound was to build the serpent of rocks as a, a large, uh, what would you say, physical manifestation of one of their significant ritual, um, ritual animals. So it's still there as far as I know. Uh, it's not too far from the um, uh, Big Sandy River, and it is on private property, so we can't go. What did the cross and circle on the gorgets represent? Yeah, I showed a couple of examples of those cross and circles, and also in one of the um, Lifeways scenes, there was a, uh, uh, one of the um, chiefs was holding that up. Um, Mississippian religion and symbolism is linked to um, an upper world and a lower world that are um, held together around a central axis. So the sun being important in the upper world is a circle and the cross designates the four uh, cardinal directions and where that cross crosses is the central axis all of it symbolizing the beliefs um, a shorthand if you will or a cosmogram a diagram a shorthand diagram of the way they thought the world was organized of an upper world and a lower world and so forth so 
the um, cross and circle on the gorgets are a symbol of, of their world, of their belief of how their world is ordered. And every time somebody saw that cross and circle, they were reminded of their, of their beliefs, of their rituals and as, as a symbol of their belief system. This is our last question. Do we know how they use the mineral mined from the caves? Well, we have an idea. If I could go back in a time machine, well, I knew the language of the hunter-gatherer gardeners, I would go back in a heartbeat and ask them. But here's our hypothesis. Um, we know that the gypsum and mirabolite and selenite from the caves um, were mined by the native peoples because we see the tools that they used and the evidence of where the minerals were knocked off the cave walls. We infer that the gypsum was used as paint, a white paint, and we infer that the mirabolite um, was used because of its medicinal properties as a laxative. There is also some suggestion, or some people have suggested, that both minerals have a kind of salty taste, and so it, judiciously used uh, for, for seasoning, or perhaps as a food preservative. Um, when you think of salting pork, salted pork to, to keep pork, um, or salted um, beef jerky or something like that. So uh, perhaps uh, these minerals were used um, to help preserve animal meat um, for, for a period of time. Some people have also suggested that um, these, um, these minerals mined from these caves like Mammoth Cave were um, also mined because they could be traded for things that the hunter-gatherer gardeners wanted and didn't have in their, um, in their homeland. So uh, food, paint, uh, medicine, seasoning, and trade are some suggestions for um, how they used this, this mineral from the caves. Thank you so much, Quinn, for such a fascinating and informative webinar. Um, and we appreciate, we sure do appreciate your outstanding presentation, and we hope this will further help uh, dispel the myth of whether or not Native people lived in Kentucky when, in fact, They've been here since 9,500 BC. Exactly. <laughs> Remember to visit our website for upcoming webinars and other events and to view and download the five handouts from today's webinar. And be sure to visit Preservation Kentucky's YouTube for this and other webinar recordings. We appreciate your participation. Hope you have a great afternoon and enjoy the rest of your week.